The Cynthia Moody Bess Award 3-on-3 Basketball Tournament Jay Millianus, Special to the Standard Gawartha Lakes Labor for learning before you grow old, for learning is greater than silver or gold. Silver and gold may vanish away, but a good education will never decay. This is an old Jamaican poem, which Cynthia Moody instilled in her son, Paul Riley, when he was young. It has had a positive impact, as he is now a successful businessman and a respected lawyer in the community. With his mother's inspiration, Mr. Riley has decided to give back to the community by raising money to subsidize the first year of continuing education at a university or college for disadvantaged young men and women. The tournament and scholarship Mr. Riley hosts will feature a three-on-three basketball tournament, emphasizing fast, strategic play and creating an exhilarating high-speed competition. The tournament organizers have been tirelessly working to bring families, friends, and local businesses together for a day of fun and camaraderie. The tournament is open to age groups under 12, under 13, under 14, and under 15, 16, with varying skill levels, ensuring everyone, regardless of their basketball experience, can participate and enjoy the event. The event is being held at the Boys and Girls Club, BGC, Kawarthos, located at 107 Lindsay Street in Lindsay. The entry fee for the tournament is $60 per team, with four players per side and three games guaranteed. Some of the event's many sponsors include Bell Mobility and Days In, Lindsay. Registering for the tournament is a simple process. Just email jill.sutherland at rileyfirm.ca or call 705-324-4090 to secure your spot in this exciting event. We look forward to welcoming you to the Cynthia Moody Bess Award 3-on-3 Basketball Tournament. Scugog marks National Public Works Week. Dan Kearns, The Standard. Scugog. The Township of Scugog marked National Public Works Week at a recent planning and community affairs meeting. National Public Works Week runs from May 19th until May 25th. It's an awareness week focusing on the importance of municipal employees across North America. As we celebrate this year's Public Works Week, let's remember the contribution Township staff make towards providing services like transportation, stormwater treatment, public buildings and spaces, public parks and grounds, emergency management and first response, right-of-way management, and winter maintenance. Scugog's Acting Director of Public Works and Infrastructure, Robert Frasca, said. He also explained the importance behind raising awareness of these employees. All of these services and more are what makes our community a dynamic place to live and work. This year, the theme for National Public Works Week is Advancing Quality of Life for All. Province gives green light to new Beaver River Bridge. Daryl Knight, The Standard. Brock. After several months of closure, there is a plan to reopen the Beaver River Bridge in Beaverton. The bridge has been closed since late last year due to structural issues. Over the ensuing months, local councillors have actively lobbied the provincial government for potential solutions, including temporary and permanent solutions, to reopen one of the main passageways into Beaverton. The closure has resulted in issues with school bus routes, snow clearing efforts, and increased traffic volume on other local roads due to continued closure. Last week, though, Regional Councillor Mike Jubb issued a statement which had been months in the making. The province has heard the message following a meeting with provincial ministers in Toronto. Word came from the province's Treasury Board that approval had been granted for both the temporary and permanent bridge structures. This is extremely good news, commented Councillor Jubb. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, and moving forward with temporary and permanent solutions, they'll work in tandem. Councillor Jubb noted the project still requires final approval from the region of Durham, but he was confident it will be fast-tracked. Rest assured, contractor Algonquin Bridge has already begun work on the project to expedite delivery and alleviate traffic concerns into and around Beaverton. We are committed to keeping you updated on the progress and ensuring a smooth transition during this period. While timelines are still in flux and design work is currently happening behind the scenes, Township staff are hopeful the temporary bridge can reopen during the summer. Health Department urges everyone to take precautions against tick bites. Durham. May is National Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Durham Region Health Department reminds everyone black-legged ticks are widespread across Durham Region, especially in forested or grassy bushy areas. 
The importance of taking precautions to avoid tick bites should not be underestimated, as these tick bites could lead to Lyme disease infections. Although not all black-legged ticks are infected with Lyme disease, some ticks may carry the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, which can cause Lyme disease in humans and animals. Once the snow melts and early spring begins, ticks become active, looking for a blood meal, and will remain active right up until the first heavy snowfall, usually in late autumn. While it is possible to become infected by a tick at any time during tick season, many people become infected with Lyme disease in the spring and early summer through a bite of a nymph. Nymph stage ticks, which are a juvenile stage of black leg ticks, are extremely tiny, as small as a poppy seed, and nymph bites are very difficult to detect. Reports of tick bites and Lyme disease infections in Durham Region residents have increased significantly over the past number of years as the black leg tick population is expanding throughout southern Ontario. In 2023, the Health Department received reports of 110 confirmed and 15 probable human cases of Lyme disease compared to 59 confirmed and 38 probable human cases in 2022. Lyme disease is preventable. Detecting and removing ticks from the skin promptly will help you to prevent infection. Transmission of the Lyme disease causing bacteria usually requires a tick to be attached to the skin and feeding for at least 24 hours. Ticks should be removed carefully so they remain intact and their mouth parts are not broken off below the skin surface. Pointed tweezers are an effective tool to help with removing ticks. If detected early, Lyme disease can be treated successfully with antibiotics. Early symptoms of Lyme disease can appear within a few days or up to a month after a bite from an infected tick. Symptoms may include fever or chills, headache, muscle or joint pain, fatigue, stiff neck, and swollen lymph nodes. Also, 70-80% to 80 of infected individuals may experience an expanding red rash, which often looks like a bullseye target. If left untreated, Lyme disease can progress to a more serious long-term illness involving the heart, joints, and nervous system. Anyone who develops symptoms after being bitten by a tick should see a healthcare provider as soon as possible. Lyme disease diagnosis is based on detection of clinical signs and symptoms, known exposure to a tick, or a history of living in or traveling to an area where ticks are likely to be found. If you find a tick on the ground or one crawling on you which is not attached and feeding, and you would like to know if it's a black-legged tick, visit etick.ca for further information. This website accepts pictures of ticks and provides tick identification. The website is maintained by Bishops University in Quebec and is associated with several other Canadian universities. Although the risk of becoming infected with Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections is still relatively low, you can reduce the risk by taking precautions when enjoying outdoor activities. This is especially important if you frequent brushy or forested areas where ticks are most found. Precautions include wearing long pants, a long sleeve shirt, socks, and closed footwear. Tucking your pants into your socks and wearing light-colored clothing makes ticks easier to spot. Using an insect repellent containing DEET or picaridin on your clothing and exposed skin. Taking a shower within one or two hours of being outdoors and examining your body thoroughly for ticks while showering. Routinely checking pets for ticks and consulting a veterinarian regarding long-term protection for pets. For more information and to subscribe for email updates on Lyme disease, please visit durham.ca forward slash Lyme or contact the Durham Health Connection Line at 905-668-2020 or 1-800-841-2729. For the most up-to-date information about areas in Ontario where there is a frequent risk of Lyme disease, visit Public Health Ontario's website at publichealthontario.ca. To submit a tick picture for identification, visit etick.ca. How Did Life Get So Frustrating? By Tina Y. Gerber McCurley. I must admit, it's a struggle for me when dealing with technology for a variety of reasons. I recently deleted my Hotmail account, resulting from a struggle I had to identify myself as the owner of this page. With trouble seeing and my slow typing, the attempt to fill out the questionnaire took forever. Consequently, they closed the page. I ended up crying and annoying my daughter Emily, as she is my go-to person. It can be a bit overwhelming and intimidating when you're a senior. The result was to write my articles for May the old-fashioned way. The difficulties can seem enormous and impossible to overcome, but the fact is, learning how to handle technology will outweigh the effort to learn. 
Many seniors have physical limitations. They can deal with fear of the unknown, computer anxiety, and even memory loss, which can all prevent seniors from accessing the potential benefits for their health, safety, and social connections. Most seniors, like me, aren't comfortable with the unknown, and it can feel increasingly awkward. Often, experts advise as we become more familiar, it will be less intimidating. I'm not sure about that, yet I try to keep an open mind. I have never put my personal information out on the internet. As experts say, seniors should address learning best practices for internet safety. We need to know how to use online tools properly. As seniors, it needs to be recognized some areas of the brain begin to shrink with age, to varying degrees, and communication between neurons slow down. It's a natural process. This often pauses a challenge to seek and learn new technology, as often our brains will characterize things negatively. However, reframing new skills is a positive response. There's a widespread assumption seniors are technologically illiterate. I am, but that's not always the case. The motivation to learn is important, especially when family, friends, and grandchildren live far away. Certainly, technology can significantly enhance the lives of seniors, enabling us to stay connected, maintain our independence, and access essential services. Tablets, smartphones, e-readers, and video calls allow everyone to stay connected, reducing the feelings of isolation. As seniors, we need to explore innovative solutions which will empower us to thrive and transform our everyday lives. We are able to use technology for the glory of God and the betterment of society, or use it for self-destructive purposes. Remember, technology is a tool, and how we use it determines its impact on our lives. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding, a podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. It's once again time to look at the etymology of phrases. Ever wonder where some of our frequently used sayings come from? What in the world is an ironclad contract? This came about from the ironclad ships in the Civil War. It meant something so strong it could not be broken. The Mississippi River was a main way of traveling from north to south. Riverboats carried passengers and freight, but they were expensive, so most people used rafts. Everything had the right of way over rafts, which were considered cheap. The steering oar on the rafts was called a riff, and this was transposed into riffraff, meaning low class. What in the world is a cobweb? The old English word for spider was cob. Traveling by steamboat was considered the height of comfort. Passenger cabins on the boats were not numbered, instead they were named after states. To this day, cabins on ships are still called staterooms. Early beds were made with a wooden frame. Ropes were tied across the frame in a crisscross pattern. A straw mattress was then put on top of the ropes. Over time, the ropes stretched, causing the bed to sag. The owner would then tighten the ropes to get a better night's sleep, hence the saying, sleep tight. Showboats were floating theaters built on a barge that was pushed by a steamboat. They played small towns along the Mississippi River. Unlike the boat shown in the movie Showboat, these did not have an engine. They were gaudy and attention-grabbing, which is why we say someone who's being the life of the party is showboating. In the days before CPR, a drowning victim would be placed face down over a barrel and the barrel would be rolled back and forth in an effort to empty the lungs of water. It was rarely effective. If you're over a barrel, you're in a deep trouble. Heavy freight was moved along the Mississippi in large barges pushed by steamboats. These were hard to control and would sometimes swing into piers or other boats. People would say they barged in. Steamboats carried both people and animals. Since pigs smelled so bad, they'd be washed before being put on board. The mud and other filth that was washed off was considered useless hogwash. The word curfew comes from the French phrase couvre-feu, which means cover the fire. It was used to describe the time of blowing out all lamps and candles. It was later adopted into Middle English as curfew, which later became the modern curfew. In the early American colonies, homes had no real fireplaces, so a fire was built in the center of the room. In order to make sure the fire did not get out of control during the night, 
It was required that, by an agreed-upon time, all fires would be covered with a clay pot called a curfew. When the first oil wells were drilled, they had no provision for storing liquid, so they used water barrels. That is why to this day we speak of barrels of oil rather than gallons. As a newspaper goes through the rotary printing press, friction causes it to heat up. Therefore, if you grab the paper right off the press, it's hot. And therefore, the expression hot off the press means to get immediate information. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and this is You've Got to Be Kidding. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media with permission from the Standard Media Group. We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper.